planning to cut the things I didn't have the slides off, but now that David brought up slides, I would like to do Super Ego Superman. <laughs> Sounds good, huh? Rather than the four psychoanalytic hypotheses about art that I had worked on, one is melancholy, one is sublimation, one is symbolization with an object theory background, and one is ideals and idealization. I won't be able to do all three remaining ones. And I guess I think that the most interesting one in terms of ones in terms of the works of art and the new works that we could discuss would be melancholy and um, ideals and idealization. And then uh, we, I have to negotiate with Paula about object theory that she was interested in. Now, there is, there is one, let's say, one hypothesis that is that art has to do with melancholy, that somehow there is a relationship between the impulse to create art and melancholy. And hi. And Sarah Kaufman's 1985 book, La Mélancolie de l'art, or Mélancolie de l'art, is a good example of that, um, of working with that hypothesis, and that's my starting point here. Point here. Now, the interesting thing about this, and the reason why I want to bring it up, is that unlike the sublimation idea, um, melancholy is not an overall decisive factor in culture. You cannot say culture comes out of melancholy. That would be ridiculous. Also, in psychoanalytic contexts, you cannot say that everybody is suffering from melancholy. That's not the case. Although everybody sublimates, not everybody is melancholic. So that would be a, a well, that would be a possibility to say this is something that is not generalizable by definition, but can be helpful for the understanding of words. <coughs> Now, melancholy is related to loss. It is melancholy that I, I'm supposed to say, right? I, I just can't get this straight. Melancholy is related to loss. So if there are no losses to suffer, there would be no need to mourn. And if all mourning were successful, there would be no melancholy. Uh, so there are two restrictions. Some people don't suffer losses ever, because they die first, for example. Or uh, they are just uh, happy all the Sorry? You have yet romantic poets who died at the age of 26 who still wrote melancholy poems. Right, yeah, you can, of course. <laughs> melancholy doesn't have to come from a real loss, from a biological loss, but anyway, it is a specific thing. Now, in Freud's definition, melancholy is failed mourning. And in case of the loss, the process, this is how he explains it, in case of loss, the, pro the process of detachment from the lost object, it's a lost love object that triggers melancholy. And that can be a person, but it can also be something else, and that's why the yeah. romantic poets could state first their loss and then write the poetry. And you know. that det the process of detachment may may be hampered by the overwhelming force of identification of the subject with the object, and that's what triggers melancholy. Melancholy. As a result, the subject cannot free itself from the object, nor can it invest in other objects because there's no no room for other objects because the there is no spa space left. The place is taken by the lost object. Now, melancholy results in powerlessness. And if we relate it to art, there is a paradox from the start and maybe a contradiction. We have to worry about that. Not because it relates beauty to sadness, because there is no inherent relation between beauty and, and happiness. Uh, but because it relates to creation of an, or investment of an object with the incapacity to relate to objects. That is the paradox. If, you, if melancholy is the incapacity to relate to objects, then how could art come out of that? Because that is precisely the opposite. Now, Sarah Kaufman develops this in her book, but not in a very theoretical way. So I had to kind of work through her uh, discourse to get at the theoretical uh, background. She gives the example of Gross's girls, girl weeping over a dead bird. There is this gross painting where you see a girl in front of a bird cage and the bird is dead and is lying in the, in the foreground of the painting. And she says this is not about, um, this girl is not mourning her dead bird, but she's mourning beauty. Now this is easy to say, but what does that mean? Making or relating to beauty is an attempt to escape from the elusiveness of all things 
is what Kaufman says, which, according to this argument, we mourn all the time. So there is a sense of elusiveness, and that's how the romantics could mourn without loss, because this elusiveness was there all the time. So you can mourn something that you lose, that you lose a priori. But while seeking consolation in beauty, we discover that beauty itself is elusive, and that's how it becomes a double object of mourning. Art then mourns itself, is the outcome of this argument. We create art in order to create beauty that gives us sim simultane simultaneously the illusion of eternity, the awareness of elusiveness, and the mourning of that clash. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not for nothing that we want art to be eternal, that we always say the real art will stay. And that is according to this idea, precisely because art is about it's not staying and there is a clash, and that is what we mourn. Hence, Gavaris's girl does not mourn anything concrete. She is mourning. She represents mourning, thus giving us occasion for mourning. Now, the semiotic implications of this view are complex, indirect, and difficult to grasp and touch upon representation. Kaufmann starts out discussing Arist Aristotle's devil conception of mimesis as both copying and supplying but in any case, somehow reduplicating and replacing reality. You know that mimesis has uh, an accusative, uh, for, uh, let's say, an object, but that can be the copy and the model at the same time. So you can do mimesis of some real thing, or you can say mimesis of, and then it would be the painting. And that doubleness gets lost in um, discussions about it. Now, Kaufman relates that to the fascination with and fear of resemblance, and she gets examples from antiquity, like the dead body, the antique colossus, that, that gigantic statue that is supposed to double uh, reality, and the mirror image in the Lacanian sense. Each of those cases exemplify the surplus meaning, that atopia, that something that doesn't quite match between the object that represents and through resemblance refers to something which it is and is not. It mirrors it, but it is not it. And that is an atopia that is that you cannot get rid of. And that atopia necessitates that something be done in order to reinstate the reassuring categories of being, something magic. I quote Kaufman here. Art concerns not a simple annihilation of the real, which would still be a way to control it, you just say fiction. That is one reason why we attach so much importance to the question of fiction and of its distinction from something real. And somehow there is an opposition implied between fiction and reality that maybe is not at all arguable. But it's sacrifice in the sense that Bataille says that sacrifice changes, destroys its victim, but does not neglect it. See what I mean? Sacrificing reality would be something else than disposing of reality. It concerns a slippage of the real. It's suspension, where all immediate meanings gets lost. In other words, see what I mean, or what she means? In this doubling, you are confronted with the impossibility to grasp reality, which is a way not of mastering it, not of getting rid of it, but of being stuck with it and its problems. And in this sense, Kaufman can equate the sacrifice of the subject that loses itself in its overinvestment in the lost object and the loss of that object, which triggers melancholy. And I'll get to a, a very convincing example in a minute, so that because I know this is quite difficult to, to grasp. Resemblance creates a loss of identity similar to that caused by overinvestment in the lost object by the melancholic subject. Melancholic, right? Subject, who in the process sacrifices itself. No? Could you just read the sentence again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Resemblance creates a loss of identity. And this is, just think of the mirror stage that we talked about. It's you, you, sta you instate your identity through <coughs> the loss of it. Resemblance creates a loss of identity similar to that co caused by overinvestment in the lost object by the melancholic subject. In other words, resemblance and melancholy go together. It's the same kind of atopia, displacement, not 
being able to coincide with yourself. Because in, in a, uh, the case of melancholy, of melancholy, which is failed mourning, you are over investing in an object, you lose the object. And so you lose yourself, in a way. There is something fundamentally missing. And that is how the melancholic subject sacrifices itself. Now, conceived in this way, the hypothesis concerning the relationship between the processes of art and me melancholy has an interdisciplinary background that exceeds the simple borrowing of concepts between disciplines. The psychoanalytic side requires that an object be lost, right? There has to be some loss that we can talk about, whatever the object is. Hence, we need to identify that object and the event of its loss, or we won't have a case. In Kaufman's view, beauty, the ultimate resource for the sufferers of loss, constitutes loss by its elusiveness. So in some ways, beauty and loss are already identified. Mourning, then, becomes melancholy because the lost object was the last resource, because you look for consolation in beauty, and then if beauty itself represents loss, then you're, you're stuck and you have nothing. And losing beauty shows the subject that all objects are lost beforehand. So in a way, beauty teaches melancholy as a, an attitude in life. And as he said, go to romanticism, and you see it happens as, as an artistic principle. But what is this concept of beauty, can we ask them? When is art beautiful enough to trigger melancholy? And what is to be gained by this undeniably romant romantic view? The link here, or maybe the leap, brings us to the semiotic side, and I'm trying constantly to bring those two together. The feeling of loss is related to, or perhaps is, the atopia that characterizes mimesis, this, this kind of false resemblance that is in fact a creation, but of something that you then cannot really identify. The double concept of mimesis, which is described in an almost Persian language in Aristotle, if you look at it, it's, it's um, I wrote a review article of an edition of the Poetics in Poetics Today in 82 that you could look up into where I kind of translate my Mises in Persian language, and you really get very far there. Now, that concept provides an entrance to the problem. As Kaufman rightly writes, the duality of Aristotelian mimesis is not an opposition. And here again, we are trapped by the idea that between the copy and the product, there should be an opposition. It's rather the case that the opposition is a feature of what it describes and what constitutes its intrinsic fictionality. This antithetic interpretation of mimesis has brought about a stream of philosophies, aesthetic philosophies, based on a fictional dualistic interpretation of the concept of mimesis that is by definition not dualistic. Because we interpret it in that way. We say, oh, that must mean this or that, so it can mean both, and that's an opposition, and therefore you have streams of aesthetic philosophy that say that beauty is original creation, and the others say beauty is imitation of models. And here are two streams that go apart, which in Aristotle are not apart. And it's difficult with our background to realize that that makes a tremendous difference. So there is a displacement there that we have a hard time getting rid of. Resemblance, then, is both similarity and dis difference. There's nobody who ever said that resemblance is identity, right? It's similarity and difference. And the object stands for but is not something else. Its status as sign is what constitutes, inaugurates, its being loss. That is, you would always say semiosis itself is loss. Because you, ne you can never really make the signs coincide with what you want to say. Now, if we follow these suggestions and think of melancholy as a discursive mediator to deal with visual art, we would say art is effective if it is self-reflexive, because that is how you get closest to, to let's say, this experience of loss. But self-reflexivity gains a new dimension and a new set of nuances. The effective work of art will present an object lost by definition. Hence, signs with stands for, stand for something else, and it will simultaneously represent the resulting atopia. The duality of such works triggers in the addressee the uneasy feeling, which uncannily suggests that we are not just looking at one thing, but that something is happening at another level than the one we are looking at. 
and and that is this this kind of atopia, this sense of mismatch. And we have in fact seen this happening already a couple of times. But the Polish writer is is a good case. Now the Polish writer, I'll show it in a minute. Is the case I, I picked out here because it somehow exemplifies the implications of this view. It is one of most of Rembrandt's most enigmatic paintings. It stands alone in his work, and the enigma it includes more than the work itself. Again, here we have a discourse that is really amazing, which includes the enigma of its autographic wholeness. It is supposed to be a work that is doubted. The authenticity is doubted. And the authenticity problem focuses but on particular parts of the work. And now I shall show you. <coughs> oh, OK. Well, it's, not, it's not a terrific slide, but it's, it's, feasi it's feasible to discuss it. Now, parts of what, what the authenticity problem is here is like the horse and the background. And the background is, and the body of the rider also, but that's not such a clear case. The horse is said to be too meager to be a real horse. And then there was this, this whole fuss about whether this was a representation on stage that he painted, or, and we don't have to worry about that. And the background is supposed to be badly painted. However, the circumstances of his genesis, the identity of the cis, of this, sorry, moreover, Aside from these problems, the circumstances of his genesis, nobody knows why he did it. The identity of the sitter is unknown. A possible commission, nobody knows. All that is so enig enigmatic that careers are built on attempts to solve these problems. <laughs> I know about a dissertation and someone who got a terrific job uh, who traced down the sitter. And that doesn't make sense at all because we we'll get to there in a, we get there in a minute. The painting stands completely alone in the artist's work. He did do yet very few horses and never riders. Although it shares features with several of his periods in style, I, I really think that you can recognize it. In fact, um, Christine, did you bring that book? Maybe we can later pass it around because it has a detail of the face, and I want to talk about the face. The first encounter between the work as painting and the work of melancholy can be, perceived, can be perceived in the tone of the critical discourse about the painting. And as I did yesterday, I want to use the critical discourse as a kickoff, as, let's say, evidence that something is going on. Um, this, the, the discourse here is more than usual, usually paraphrastic, repetitive, and avowedly impotent an indexical sign of the critic's affect by the encounter with the work. And again, Kenneth Clark, I, I said yesterday, there are two works which he cannot deal with, the Samson and this work. And it's obviously a completely different work. This is not at all the same kind of problem that the Samson poses. Um, he phrases his admiration. Everybody loves the painting, and so do I. He phrases his admiration for the painting in a way that seems to be so it seems to confirm the workings of the melancholic hypothesis. He calls it one of the most personal and mysterious of his later paintings, although at the same time its authenticity is doubted. And one of the great poems of painting. And that, le that statement uh, refers to a visual verbal problem that I think is very pointed. Now, we have to get at the question why this could be a poem in painting rather than a novel or, or a history painting that would be a, a, a theater thing. Now, others react equally strongly to its strange quality. The word strange comes up all the time. In Polish writer discourse, the word strange is the key word. One possible response to the affective attack by the paint, uh, painting on the critic viewer, there is, that is, the, the, I consider that an attack by the painting, that unsettling quality, can be explained away by, the st by tracing the sitter's identity or, the quali or by qualifying it as Orientalism. Those are two classical responses. Well, it looks so strange, but that's because so-and-so is the sitter, or that's because it's Orientalism. There is a whole book, Rembrandt and Persia, which is almost completely on this painting and Samson's wedding that we talked about, and which is tracing minutely 
the sources, the possible sources, and completely out of the blue Why? sources. <coughs> hmm? Because at some point in the 18th or 19th century, people assumed that this was a Polish costume. But there, there is this one scholar who traces it as Oriental, that, as Persian. Now, the painstaking efforts of those attempts to trace it back to sources um, are somehow not in proportion to the weight of the conclusions. To write a whole book just to conclude that there are possibly Persian sources doesn't seem in any proportion to, to the answer. So there is this surplus of force in relation to the meaning in the critical discourse that seems uh, significant and that I think is comparable to Snyder and Cohen's emotional scientificity, right? This kind of scientism that becomes an emotional stake. Um, and in fact, there is the, in, the, in these publications a striking evasion of the question of the work as a whole. Nobody really, all they say is it's strange, and then they go about tracing the sources for the uh, the quiver, for example, or the hat, and don't talk about the page. So it's fracturized, uh, fractured into uh, hard problems. This move to set out and naturalize the strangeness of the work is clearly an, an attempt to strip it of its otherness by seeing in it what it is not, to insert a reassuring discourse in order to avoid the working of the more troubling image. In other words, to replace the possibility of melancholy, of melancholy, I keep doing it, of melancholy with positive data about the work's genesis. Now, if we wish to understand this work or to do something with our own response to it, and here I regret that the slide is not better quality uh, and not more detailed because you probably don't have this immediate hit that you had with the Samson. Uh, but go to the Frick collection and listen. It's kind of big. It's almost, um, I would say, it's as high as the as the screen here, and a little wider. So the slide is square, and it shouldn't be. It's a little wider, and it it's too bad. But in the free collection, it's hang it's it hangs a little too high, so there is a reflection on the eyes precisely, which is really too bad. But you can call and ask if they take it off, and they would, or ask to see it outside of the uh, normal hours, and then. You can go up with the ladder and, and take a good look. But they are really good in the free collection. Now, if you want to understand this, not as the product of historical accidents, but as the locus of an interaction, we will have to account for the painting and its strangeness, for the work itself and the responses it provokes. So here again, as with the Samson, we have that problem of response. Now, one feature that, according to Clark, accounts for the painting's strangeness is the almost feminine beauty of the writer's face. This sexual ambiguity of the represented writer is naturalized immediately by reference to the sitter, who might be, but as always, might also not be, the same as the woman sitting for Potiphar's wife. And Paula yesterday immediately said so. I asked, I said, have you seen this face before? Yes, the woman in the Washington painting of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Remember that most mysterious of the two. That could be the same sitter. But again, it could also be Rembrandt who makes the faces similar. There is always this attempt to put, this is this problem of atopia and resemblance, you see, that uh, rather than see the resemblance between two fa painted faces, there is the attempt to refer it back to a real third, uh, the, the, the tertius comparationis, or however you call that. Now, we have already seen to what extent the two represented um, women in the Potiphar's are different according to the status of the representations they are involved in as fictitious, imaginary, or theatrical, in spite of the coincidence of model, probably, and character. That is, according to Clark, this is the same face as the sitter for the two Potiphar paintings. But I would say this face is much closer to the one Potiphar painting than the two Potiphar paintings to each other. That, well, that theatrical one doesn't seem to be the same face, although it is physically the same face. The same face as Joseph? No, no. The, the woman, Potiphar's wife, in the two paintings. The paintings is, the no, the paintings. 
Remember the one? There was this very theatrical one where Joseph was gesturing, and there was this very still one in Washington. And the one was <laughs> ugly and the other beautiful. <laughs> and the case that I'm trying to make is this man looks more like the one woman than the one woman like the other woman, although the two women are supposed to be the same. And this is supposed to be different. So it's not the, the issue is not who the real sitter is. I'm trying to say, and I'll come back to this when we talk about the Bellona, that the, uh, th that is that sense of atopia that critics tend to get rid of by referring it back to a real model. Okay, so referring the writer to this woman, hence to these two figures, is not necessarily without interesting intertextual resonances. I think it is interesting to worry about that, especially in the case where we have already seen how this woman in the, in the Washington painting is, in a sense, in a melancholic process. And also, it can lead us to an encounter between the writer as overdetermined by femininity and the woman as identified with the young heroic figure in the, in the writer. That is, if you confront the two paintings with each other, the Washington Joseph and this one, you could make comments about how they relate to each other and how he becomes overdetermined by femininity and she by heroism. But as an attempt to do away with the work's strangeness, such an explanation seems utterly beside the point. All it can do, and that is all for the good, is raising questions about the relations between strangeness and beauty, strangeness of the work and the beauty of the represented knight, the represented writer. Beautiful because almost feminine, and yet a knight that is a model of masculinity in the feudal tradition. And let's not forget that he is represented as a, a knight on a horse. Unless we want to reconsider this cliché about uh, the feudal tradition and emphasize its strangeness, its strange relation between fatherly power and prolonged filial dependency. That is, the painting could refer us back to our clichés about medieval knights and their attitude and their relation to the suzerain, how do you say that, to their, uh, their lords. So how is he a knight? He's a knight, he's represented as a knight with the, the, the hat and the, and the quiver and the horse, everything that, that's established even as some or, an order of nobility. Yeah, yeah. Well, nobody knows. It's, just, it's considered to be just a knight, and nobody quite knows, and that's where you have all these attempts to figure out who could possibly be portrayed and symbolized with these features. But I think that why don't we just stop there and say, well, there are these, there's this attempt to make turn this into a knight, and there is also this attempt to turn it into a woman, and everything else, no big deal. We don't know anyway. Now, a second feature that is called upon to understand the word strangeness is the gaze of both rider and horse. And here I want to really work out something each directed towards some unattainable goal. The one is looking back and the other is looking forward. And this much critics have said, but they never did anything more with that. Now this formulation suggests a narrativization of the portrait-like painting. It's considered a portrait, and that's why there is this dissertation about who the sitter could be, because it's supposed to to be uh, not, a, not a, a random sitter, but someone who sat for a portrait. And uh, this narrativization is both obvious and problematic. These cases and the discursive response to them will provide some sort of key to the solution of a problem which Kaufman, in her book on the melancholy of art, uh, the melancholy of art, leaves unanswered. Melancholy refers to a story as a concept. That is, here I want to re refer back to the Freudian concept: the loss of the loved object, the attempt to mourn it the failure of that attempt, the process of investment of the object in the self, and the subsequent fixation, which closes off new object relations. All this implies a process in time. How then can a single work of art be the loss and its mourning, as well as the failure of that process, at the same time? In other words, how does the discourse of psychoanalysis narrativize the painting, the cases, 
of horse and rider are directed spatially towards some unattainable goal outside of the picture. Unattainable because irretrievable, lost in space because lost in time, we might say. The object is outside the representation itself. Moreover, the gazes diverge between the two. The split between the subject of gazing, of longing, and the lost object is represented within the representation. So this is how it becomes self-reflexive. Uh, unity of horse and rider, one of Freud's favorite metaphors for the unity of ich and it, of ego and, uh, and how do you say it? it. <laughs> that constitutes the subject is broken by the divergence of the gazes. Spatially, the directions differ. Narratively, the aims, the objects differ. The contiguous space and the future object are represented in their negative coincidence, in their loss. That is, the very fact that they differ, that they mismatch, um, represents that loss. In narratological terms, the object of focalization is nothingness. There is no object, which is not the same thing as nothing. I mean, nothingness is, po is a positive term, while well, nothing would be a negative term. This structure of focalization, the insistent concentration on nothingness and the divergent reaching outside the work, represents the limit of focalization itself. The gazes, in their double relation to time and space, introduce a tension between the narrative and the descriptive modes of representation. As Svetlana Alpers argues in her book, The Art of Describing, Rembrandt explores the limits of the descriptive mode that distinguishes Dutch art in the 17th century from Italian art, which was much more directly narrative. And the, her hypothesis about Las Meninas is also that there is the double mode and the conflict between the two, the clash between the two, that is in fact the object of representation. And I could argue the same thing for this painting. But description itself is rarely void of narrativity. More often than not, a descriptive work or passage inserts narrative modes through narrative devices, such as tense, voice, vocalization, and through rhetorical devices, such as metaphor and metonymy. And I have to refer here to the article on description that is somebody, you have it, right? Somebody has it here, that I wrote years ago that is kind of a formalistic approach to this problem of how description is narrativized. Here, the directionality of the gaze in the painting entails description, the mode of representation of what is seen. That is, as soon as you have a gaze, the mode of description comes up as a possibility. But nothing is seen, and rider and horse see this nothing in different spaces. The horse looks straight ahead, while the rider looks obliquely, obliquely back. The teleology of the gazes, their object-orientedness, entails narration the mode of representation of what has happened and what will happen. But what happened is loss, the loss of beauty's duration, for example. And what will happen is the unattainability of the object. So melancholy, <coughs> melancholy, oh no, Melan melancholy. I, I don't know why I don't get this straight. Maybe because I refuse to be called in it. Melancholy, yes, by its fixating and paralyzing power, makes the story into nothingness, into description, that is. It is this tension that allows the melancholy, yeah, okay, that allows the melancholy hypothesis to operate, where object and time, implied by loss and mourning, produce narration, the unattainability of the object, rendering the gaze pointless. The gaze, but what gaze? This is not a case where we are addressed, for example. It's precisely because we're not addressed that we feel pointless. This unattainability renders the gaze pointless and triggers melancholy. For this reason, the knight representing beauty should be beauty himself, beautiful, and ambiguously so, through femininity, through otherness, that is, this, this makeup as a knight and the feminine face itself represents that mismatch of resemblance and representation. In this way, he becomes it, the beautiful man whose identity at one level we might want to uncover becomes beauty itself, ungraspable and anonymous. And so we should not worry about who he is. The represented object becomes representation. Now this, if, if you take it that 
the horse and rider, as Freud wants it to be, are a unity, then you have a cross-eyed gaze again that we know now to be so characteristic of Rembrandt, if you take it as two eyes, one eye of the rider and one eye of the horse. And we'll see in a minute with the Samson that, again, there is always this cross-eyed gaze that refers to two modes or to a clash or to something. Um, so this narrative in the world, so the time we say the joke is about the horse, a man and a horse, and um, suddenly so what's the narrative, where are you going, and then it says, that's the horse. Oh, yeah, right, well, that's a wonderful illustration of it. It is really nice, yeah. Now, so, the, so if we take that as the unity, and of course this is an anachronistic projection of Freud, but just see what happens if we do that. This, we have a cross-eyed gaze that may shed no light on a typically Rembrandtish phenomenon uh, that uh, that is this dual, not dualistic, but a kind of clash between modes of uh, of uh, representation. And I, I think it is related to the blind man problem. The paradox of the blind gaze, the dead eye and the fixated eye, in particular, is particularly acute in some of the paintings where the blind men are perhaps not blind at all. Um, and we see in the down eye, for example, that you have you are attracted to the body and then the body sen uh, sends you away. There is always something going on with the gazes. Um, and in the Hermitage, Return of the Prodigal Son, which we can also look at in, in Christine's book, you can also see that the father looks blind. And when you really look close in a close-up, he is not blind, but he looks away from the sun. So again, there is a unity that's broken by the divergent gaze. Now, um, let me just skip something because we don't have the slides of that painting, so I don't have to go into that. Now, if we go back to Sarah Kaufman's hypothesis of the relation between mimesis and m melancholy. This idea suggests how absence, how loss, and the failure to relate to the outside world can be represented in the gap between, re between two, two representational modes, description and narration, brought about in these cases by the divergence of the focus, a divergence which sets the limits to narrativity itself. In other words, it's precisely because you hesitate whether this is a portrait or a stage scene that it is significant. The psychoanalytic discourse is then a discourse that does not simplify and reduce the work again. I, I'm sorry to be defensive about psychoanalysis, but that is what it's always blamed to be. It makes the work, in fact, more complex, inserting modes of discursivity within the visual experience and even, in this case, thematized through a thematized visuality. It's, it's again, although here it's not the viewer who is addressed, it's again the way of looking that draws attention to a problematic of looking. This encounter brings the responses to the work within the work, and through this encounter it gives a new dimension to this psychoanalytic concept of melancholy itself. Melancholy becomes a mode of representation as well as its motivation. The question whether the motivation originates in the painter's irretrievable psyche or in the viewer's unacknowledged response is utterly beside the point. We need a dynamic view of symbiosis, wherein the critic tries to understand the nature of the sign event rather than the fixed, monolithic and universal correlation between sign and meaning. Within such a view, the understanding of the possibility of the melancholic event whose traces can be seen in standard critical discourse and whose origin is repeated in every one of its occurrences emerges out of an encounter rather than an application of psychoanalytic discourse and the visual work. I hope you see the difference. This is not an application because the painting has consequences for the concept as well as the other way around. Now the paradoxical relations between the negativity of loss and the sacrifice of the subject that I started out putting forward as a possible uh, contradiction and the representation through the breaking of limits of semiotic modes and means are illuminated by the painting, at least as much as the painting is illuminated by the psychoanalytic reflection. It is the case that if you bring melancholy to bear on this painting, it, you get a, a, 
a, a deeper sense, a more profound sense of what melancholy means, as well as of what the painting does. The word reflection then takes on its triple meaning, which alone protects the work of art against reductionism and, and this kind of utilitarian sense of application, use, tool, all those terms that are disturbing. It means disturb discursive thinking as well as mirroring, the mirroring of psychoanalytic discourse in the work of art. And the latter reflection works both ways, visualizing, melancholy, as a fixating, as well as narrativizing mode of representation. In other words, melancholy becomes narrativized. It gets rid of its fixation. And on the other hand, this, this, uh, this conflict between the still description and the narrativization becomes it melancholy itself. Now, so far for this, let's say, entrance into the relation between psychoanalytic discourse and visual art. Now, do you have any questions so far, or shall I move to the super ego Superman, uh, the Lona? Yes, you want to know about super ego? I know that the title would make it <laughs> make me get away with it. <laughs> um, there, are, there is this of the two Paula. I, I, where are you? I decided not to do the object theory thing because we have David brought the slides for this one, and that this. It's too attractive to, uh, to leave it aside, and it makes more sense as a coherent uh, role. Now, other psychoanalytic concepts, of course, can do this, this trick of saying something about what art is, a general statement that doesn't make sense as a general statement, but does help to understand specific works, and one of those is um, has to do with ideals. Now, it is now we have talked about narcissism. Uh, last week, and the trap of self-reflection that can lead to stagnation and to a tension that reaches the self beyond itself. And this is related to the problem of ideals and idealization that I would like to address as another, this is another statement about art. An artist is, is getting the best of themselves, idealizing almost, and the tension between idealization and an ideal, a high-powered ideal, makes art possible. Now, this can happen because the self to which the subject relates is represented for him or her as an image that is, in fact, what idealization is. The image of the self is the starting point for an inquiry into the question if art and its inherently ambitious quality can be seen in relation to ideals and idealization. That is, I consider then art as something that is ambitious. But this, of course, is also not generally, universally uh, valid. The self that becomes the object of relational investment in narcissism can be described as, and I quote here a, a psychoanalytic, uh, not critic, a psychoanalyst called Schaefer, the aggregate or organization, so far as, ex as it exists, of all the self-representations. So there is an object that consists of all self-representations. And it is important to keep in mind the plural of this noun, self-representations. That is, there is not one image of self, and we have seen in Rembrandt's case how diverse they can be. Self-representations are numerous and changing and occupy different poles, different roles in the psychic system. They are constantly tested to the standards. This notion of standards is important. The subject holds, and to the letters, representations of reality. The hypothesis that the process of art derives its dynamic from the tensions brought about by the confrontation between representations of self and of objects, for that matter, and standards the subject holds partially subsumes the sorry and standards the subject holds partially subsumes the hypothesis of narcissism. That is, these two things are related, but they are not identical. The two meet when the idealization to which the confrontation often leads concerns the self. That is not necessarily the case. You can also idealize others. And that is sometimes also what happens with Rembrandt. But idealization, in turn, must be confronted with the relation between the subject and his or her ideals. Now, what are ideals? Ideals are standards. Standards of, for example, perfection, beauty, excellence, gratification. It's the standard that you hold that you want to achieve. The concept of ideals is goal-oriented and thereby adds to narrativization related to 
this process and possibly the event of the achievement rather than to a static situation. In itself, and this is important to keep in mind, ideal, the idea of an ideal is morally and socially neutral itself. That is, one may maintain standards that are socially unacceptable, like standards of racial purity, domination, or absolute and direct gratification, or standards that are socially valued, like self-sacrifice, productivity, effective bonds, etc. That in itself doesn't change. In both cases, you have standards. And although an ethical evaluation of these standards is, of course, necessary, their ethical difference does not influence their status as standards or ideals. And so when I'm talking about narcissism or these kind of things that tend to be morally a little bit tainted, <coughs> keep in mind that this is not what I, what I have in mind. Standards are defined by the tension occurring between them and actual reality. That is, they're, they're all, uh, almost impossible to meet in principle. You always set your standards somewhere higher than reality. And if they are met, they will shift and become more demanding. And you will achieve, try to achieve the next thing. In trying to do something about the tension, one can either change the standard if the tension becomes unbearable, because the gap becomes too great, you can change the standard or change reality. And pushing towards the limits of reality in order to make ideals meet it more closely is different from changing reality. In other words, changing one's perception, representation of reality in order to make the two coincide. So on the one hand, you are pursuing an ideal and you're being ambitious to do it. On the other hand, you are idol idealizing and you go into fiction. In the first case, one is pursuing an ideal and trying to get the best out of it, and in the second case, one is idealizing. And this difference is not socially neutral. The ambition inherent in the pursuit of ideals influences the social realm accordingly, according to the social values attributed to the particular ideals, while idealization changes the relationship between the idealizing subject and his or her environment. That is, if that goes too far, the subject won't be accepted and will be excluded and not taken seriously and end up in a, in a lunatic asylum, asylum if, I mean, if you really push this as far as you can, or be pushed to kill him or herself or whatever. There is a, there is a social problem inherent in idealization. The relationship between ideals and idealization is not inclusive and not symmetrical. Ideals may or may not lead to idealization. A subject in a secondary narcissistic stage, which is that third of the th uh, three that we talked about, will tend to idealize itself by constructing self-representations that meet the subject's standards, which define the requirements for an investable love object. Since an image ma matches ideals more easily if the object is less specifically known, that is, if, if you don't quite know what you're describing, and you get back to this mimesis mismatch, it's easier to make the subject resemble the ideal. Hence, the narcissistic self-love goes through more than usual difficulty to establish a satisfying match. Hence, the tendency to idealization as we, that we have seen a little bit in that one painting. A less narcissistic subject will idealize another object and construct representations of the other that are better than reality in order to make the object meet the standards set to it. But those standards derived from the subject, so that there's also ambitious, a, a very ambitious move involved if you set very high standards and then idealize your love object. That's because you somehow think you deserve this wonderful person. But this is not meant to suggest that loving someone else is necessarily a non-narcissistic love. That I was just trying to say the contrary. Nor that stretching the limits of reality idealization is necessarily a narcissistic gesture, so it can be both ways. Now, did, did I put in the self-portrait again? No. Okay, we'll go to this one. In the, the case of the self-portrait that um, we talked about the other day, the self is made better, that is more impressive and um, more beautiful than reality. The quality of the portrait as a representation 
the insistence invested in making it as good as one possibly can is not idealization. That is, Rembrandt redeems his idealization of his face by his ideal of painting, because that is matching reality. You cannot paint better than you can. You cannot idealize your own performance. Now, let us take um, let us take this this painting, and specifically, maybe we should go back to quickly to just set this one off against it to uh, excuse me, I should have foreseen this but just uh, to, to get back into the mood of Rembrandt's faces, Rembrandt's crazy representations of his face that we briefly saw yesterday just a random set, okay we'll go back to this one here is the portrait where he is idealizing and pushing his ideal. It is quite strong, isn't it? It is incredible. I'm glad you uh, you see it. Now, compared to this, and look, look especially at the nose. Now, here it's like he has a fly on the nose. But here is, this is the most amazing secondary, no, uh, mirror stage experience. Okay, now, so there is this problem of the nose, right? I don't have to tell you that there is a problem of the nose. Here's the, here the nose is kind of avoided. He shows it just in a way that you can avoid really measuring what it looks like. Here we don't have anything to do with this. And now we have here. Quite a different nose. Now let's take the nose just as an example. And if we believe the changes affected in the nose, we must assume that Rembrandt has most problems with accepting his nose as his own. The potato nose, known from those cell etched, etched cell portraits, are evidence that there was a problem. And as I said before, that is probably an exaggeration, since Leven's portrait of Rembrandt is much more generous, although they were in competition and not doing very well as friends, apparently. In the light of the idea of the mirror stage narcissism, the ugliness of the nose seems to have made the artist feel other more than any other feature, and that's that one where he looks really amazed at himself. The idea of idealization suggests an antithetical, real, antithetical relation between these etchings and the painted self-portrait of the same period. We all, we're talking about early works here. The Polish writer, by the way, is late. It's in the mid-50s, so it's the middle period. The experience of alienation at the moment of the mirror stage leads to the standard of physical beauty that, in this case, would then be likely to include a straight nose. If someone has a problem with the nose, idealizing would attack that feature first. The etchings then signal the failure to meet the standard and the exploration on a cynical, mocking mode of that failure. The painting, in contrast, represents a solution to the tension through idealization. The limits of reality are stretched. You have um, here you have a sense of idealization, although not in a crazy way. Because of the the, the pose, you can just make the, no, the nose acceptably realistic, although it is a little bit uh, idealized. As we have seen, the ambition to be a good painter that it, this work so ostentatiously displays fulfills the function of making good for the lack of realism in the representation, which in turn is true to the experience of alienation. Pursuing the ideal of excellence in painting successfully, the artist deserves the idealization of his face. Whether or not the pride of the young man's face is realistically justified or not is not of our concern. I mean, we don't have a portrait that we can believe, and that doesn't matter, that's not what we want to talk about. There is no way to really judge. And now, yesterday somebody gave me that journal that I have to give back about attempts to dig up his skull in order to figure out what he really looked like, so that then we would be able to say if he idealized himself. I don't need the skull to see that, and I'm sure you don't. You, need, you see this portrait then you know that he's idealizing. Clear. But infusing, in the, but the fusing of the beauty of the face and that of the painting as a representational work 
points to the attempt to compromise between ideal and idealization. This is exactly what I was talking about. The good artist manages to meet the standards of excellence closely enough to allow himself to idealize his face without going too deeply into illusion, which could lead to delusion. The excellent painter cannot but produce beauty, and the nose is part of that beauty. It has to be. That is what the perfect matching of both ideas signifies as it is visible in the work. Now, the persistence of this idealization, in spite of the sharp awareness of its illusionary quality, can be seen more clearly in that Samson painting. Here. I'm sorry we don't have a colored slide, but you can see here uh, the nose as something quite striking. Now, this is the scene is called Samson threatening his father-in-law, and it is from the early marriage when his wife is taken away from him. He, he goes away in anger after he lost the, the, uh, the riddle uh, game, and then he comes back and threatens his father-in-law, supposedly, although in the Bible that is not at all the case. It is in itself interesting that Rembrandt, this is acknowledged as a self-portrait. Nobody doubts it. It is interesting that he represents himself as the young Samson, the ideal image of masculinity. We have reasons to think that masculinity, femininity, gender problems were somehow at stake in Rembrandt. And Samson, of course, is the hero of masculine, is the superman, the superman of the Bible. At first sight, the Orientalism is quite striking. And for modern standards, not without racist overtones, you don't see here on this uh, slide, but there are two black serpents, quite small and quite exaggeratingly negro, negro uh, features, like, like big mouths and noses, and it's, it's kind of racist. And the stereotyped old Jew as the father-in-law is quite striking, and we would think racist also. The biblical story has it that Samson fell in love with the daughter of the Philistines. So logically speaking, this father figure should look more pagan than Jewish. Why the hell is this man represented so strikingly Jewishly? Both these remarks are anachronistic, anachronistic and realistic. I mean, that's not what we should worry about, but it's, it's like worrying about who the sitter is in the college writer. In terms of the problematic of idealization, the nose problem has been solved here quite radically. And again, the slide is not good enough to really see it, but keeping his striking eyes, the Raman's eyes are a little high and a little close to each other. The artist gives himself not only beautiful hair, for which the narrative provides the pretext, of course, Samson and his hair is the famous thing, but also a slightly Jewish, equiline nose. And that is quite remarkable and almost a reason to doubt that it's a self-portrait. If it weren't for the eyes, we would say, well, how do we know it's a self-portrait? The caricatural father figure is endowed with the other side of what the artist seems to desire so much. The aquiline nose is handsome on the son and ugly on the father, that is ending slightly higher up than one expects above the popping eyes. There is, there is something stereotyped ugly about the father that is exactly the same feature that makes the son more handsome. More than an anecdote from Samson's prehistory, the painting represents a competition between father and son, and the fist as the navel of the text here is quite remarkable. This father then has to be as Jewish as the son, for it is more important that he resemble visually, hence authenticate the son as son, since the two are in competition on the basis of those roles, thereby enabling the latter to win the competition, and that's what Samson is supposed to do, than that he be the alien father-in-law suggested by the narrative, who should be, I mean, if he had looked at the story and worried about the story, he would make, with, with the racism of the two blacks in the background, he would make the father a kind of crazy pagan figure with kind of ornaments, and he does that in other works, so he does know how to do that. Between the two re tendencies to reductionism and the appeal to fixed uh, schemas, like the Oedipal aspects, that is addressed to the father, and it's according to the pretext, it's, it's stake right. is the conquest of the bride. Nothing is more directly and simply Oedipal. 
In the second place, it is tempting to attach this painting to the sparse known fact about Rembrandt's life. The artist's social interest in the growing Jewish population of Amsterdam in the midst of whom he chose to live, or his intense preoccupation with the Hebrew Bible, of which Samson and Joseph were among his favorites, may have been related, not to some sympathetic, uh, some, let's say, religious sympathy for uh, the Hebrew, Hebraic culture, but uh, to this entirely different dimension of narcissistic lack and idealizing tendency. The Jews had the nose, in, in a racist perspective, of course, the Jews had the nose that he coveted. <laughs> <laughs> this is not all, of course, you can also talk about he being he, his family situation was kind of Joseph's position, the younger brother who went out of the family with all these brothers, etc. Anyway, the story of the Jews may have appealed to him for reasons of self-representation. Moreover, the works are we are dealing with are all early work, all around 1635, hence a year after his marriage to a woman of a higher social class, which is also what Joseph's issue was, what Samson's issue was, etc. Uh, no, not Samson. Samson actually did not marry above his class, on the contrary. But um, Joseph did. But these speculations, however, attract however attractively they may seem to fit, are suspect and beside the point for precisely that reason. As we said yesterday, if you see the aggression so clearly, there is no repression and no... Uh, they, they just fit too well. Fitting with the artist or our image of the artist, which, don't forget, we have on the basis of the paintings almost exclusively, they leave the viewer safely out of sight. That is, we don't have to account for our own response if we do this kind of... And that's one of the attractions, of course, of this kind of biographical psychoanalysis. It is not the, questions of Rem the question of Raman's possible sense of some unacceptable ugliness, but that of the viewer's sense of idealization. It is because you say, oh, isn't that stunning, when you see the portrait that we have to worry about idealization, that the encounter between the concept and the painting should eliminate, uh, illuminate. Now, another detour before we can illuminate this picture in a more sophisticated way would be through something that at first sight also seems to lead through a false track of biographical psychoanalysis, but that soon leads through a clash between a painting and a supposed reality. Uh, not between a painting and a supposed reality, but between two paintings. Now compare this painting and its less than attractive father figure. Look well at the father figure with this painting from 19, uh, 1633. This, this slide is particularly unfortunate because it's showing how the painting has been in the process of being cleaned and you see parts are not clean and parts are clean, but never mind. Now in the Metropolitan Museum. This is the Bologna I talked about yesterday. And it's particularly unfortunate because it cuts across that shiny surface on the belly that is so nice as a whole. The traditional Bologna or war goddess with the Medusa shield. Now he is Gary Schwartz and I have set him up as one of my straw men several times. Here he is again and he hits a truth that he doesn't really, isn't really aware of. Gary Schwartz on this painting. Very much in the pose of Rembrandt himself in a self-portrait of 1631. Now that self-portrait we don't have on the slide and it's absolutely horrendous, but it has the same pose. Bellona casts her less than fiery gaze upon us. Now here are the elements, the pose of the self-portrait, the gaze, and the less than fiery gaze. Okay. Huh? Oh, do you say fiery? F-I-E-R, oh my God. Less than fiery gaze. Oh, no, 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 oh my God. Okay, I'll try, I'll try. It takes me a while, as you know. Now, Schwartz certainly does not intend to suggest this much, but I think he hits two fascinating and clashing aspects of the work in his very words. The pose of Rembrandt himself, and you're clever enough to also see something in the face, and an unfiery gaze that fits badly with the idea of Bellona. And as soon as something fits badly, we are interested more than when it fits well. The word clumsiness is near, in other words. It's an early work, and it's easy to say, well, he didn't quite know how to represent fieriness. 
Let's take these two features of the painting seriously. Fierceness. It's not the same word. It's not the same word. David Schwartz has, has fiery. Yeah, that's not the same word as fierce. I know. But I think fierce would be... Okay, let's take fierce. Maybe it's a misprint in Gary Schwartz. Okay, uh, I like fierce, fierceness much better because it's easier to pronounce. Okay, I'll just go for fierce. Now, first of all, the woman in this picture may be less than fierce. She is in any case also less than elegant. Secondly, the supposedly frightening Medusa shield, on which more shortly, is turned slightly to the side. It's kind of cast aside while her own face confronts the viewer directly. Her slightly bulging eyes are strikingly peaceful indeed, almost sully, almost pacifying, domesticating the viewer. Again, the two dangers of psychoanalytic criticism are close. It is appealing to see in this figure a portrait of Rembrandt's fiance Saskia, <laughs> whom he married in 64, a year later, and whose face, as we know, as we know it through Rembrandt's many portraits of her, is not without similarities with Bologna's face. And to foreground the intriguing question if she posed for the painting or <laughs> if, on the contrary, he sold out a woman resembling his image of Bologna. Hmm. And that is, I think, much more interesting. But in any case, we don't know and we shouldn't worry. Like in the case of Hendrix's relation to the Bathsheba, where you also had the question which came first, um, in both cases, the, in both cases, the idea would suggest itself that the young painter was afraid of women. I mean, that is, the, the, let's say, the superficial psychoanalytic way to deal with this is, oh, how horrible, he must have been afraid of women if he did this so close to his marriage, mm -hmm. and that made, made the features coincide a little bit. So biographic and schematic reduction go together. Nothing seems more plausible indeed, and at least one critic, Fernandez, a French critic, has suggested this much apropos of the ghastly, ghastly, when you say that girl in the night watch, you know, this all male painting with all those military militant men and then there was this one little girl in the background that looks like death itself. And he suggests, not afraid of any homophobia, that that is because Lerman was secretly a homosexual. And uh, that is one of those hilarious cases where anything problematic about women immediately leads to the hypothesis that there must be a homosexual tendency, which is kind of insulting, of course, in its negativity. Now, nothing seems less interesting, I'm afraid. I'm not interested in that kind of outcome of, uh, and, and again, it leads away, the discourse leads away from the painting straight into cliches and ideological prejudice. Now, the hypothesis would explain Raman's preference for the story of Tobias, who domesticated the lethal Sarah, of Joseph, who was treated so wickedly by the lady Potiphar's wife, and of Samson, who was victimized by the women he loved. So on one level, it's an easy case to make, and that's precisely why I don't like it. And sure enough, the preference is undeniable, and it would be foolish to ignore the theme it suggests. Yet the perspective that I have brought to um, the Joseph story in Rembrandt's uh, rewriting hardly warrants such a reductive hypothesis, and there will be more to say about the Samson and the Tobias works. I think that this whole hypothesis... If you just look at the painting, you see that she's not frightening at all. So again, you have it either way, it's like with the Samson and ugliness, and either she is not frightening, and then it cannot be the fear of women that he's expressing. Or it's the fear of women, but then we don't look at the painting. Now, if we read the Bellona carefully, that is visually and discurf discursively, there are several elements that we can make to interact with the Samson, with the Samson we just saw, the, the threat, uh, Samson threatening his father-in-law. The woman, although not fierce-looking, looks quite impressive as a woman. That is her whole, the, the way she is installed in her body. The sheer largeness of her body yields, so to speak, room for two. And her right hand that we can hardly see emphasizes by the distance it takes, emphasizes that she takes all the space. 
since it is not by her gaze that she represents war, this emphasis on her large body is not irrelevant. Maybe that's how she emphasizes, that's how, how she represents war. In addition, the Medusa face on the shield, rhetorical as it may otherwise be, and of course, Gary Schwartz invokes rhetoric in a negative sense, to say this is just a rhetorical expression of war and nothing else, this Medusa doesn't look any more fierce than Bellona herself. If you look well at the shield, I don't know if you can see it, but um, on one level, of course, the open mouth fulfills its traditional function of symbol of the vagina, vag vagina dentata. How do you say the vagina dentata? This kind of frightening idea of the open mouth and the teeth that it's like the vagina that would bite your penis off. I'm sorry, boys. Uh, that that is supposed to petrify the enemy. On another level, however, in combination with its eyes, it's screaming for help. And if you look at, at it in detail, I'm really sorry, maybe it's... No, it's not better in the book. Um, it's really like someone who is absolutely terrified herself or himself. The eyes on the shield look as helpless as the eyes of the father in the Samson. See? Same kind of eyes. This helplessness seems to be caused by surprise. Both the father and the Medusa don't seem to understand what the danger is about, why the threat is necessary. They seem out of touch with the issue of threat. And to turn this confrontation between the two paintings into one story, a story of ideals and idealization, which supersedes the other co-stories, like the allegorical tradition, or, and the idea of, of ornamental rhetoric that people bring to bear on this painting, we must now take into account the pose of the woman. Her pose, as Schwartz points out, repeats that of an earlier self-portrait. And pose is not always significant, really. Um, it is sometimes just taken over from an admired model, but here it's admired from, he admires his own model, because he is, he, he is taking it over from another work of himself, but it is not necessarily devoid of meaning either. And if we explore the possibility that it is meaningful here, we can see in the woman posing as the artist a figure who combines the features of a mother figure, possibly the future spouse, I don't mind, I don't care, I don't have a particular opinion about that, and those of the self, and that is more interesting. The self who, if I may say so, had disappeared within her and there's room for two. Her pose signifies the self's position, including his struggle with ideals, and the alliance with the woman, he needs to cope with it. He needs the woman to cope with his problem of, of self, in other words. The form of identification signified here further takes care of the position of the father. The shield Bologna holds, and holds off, holds aside, represents on a beam the terrified because beaten father figure, according to the pretext, defeated by Samson's doing in the story, the father gets burned to death uh, by uh, Samson's doing. The peaceful eyes of the woman reassuringly pacify the fierce eyes of the young hero in the Samson. Just look at the eyes of the hero here, which are quite striking. And if we now look back to this young man, he may be handsome, but he is not through with his struggle for the ideal self-image. First of all, his fist is clearly over-invested. It's investing more force in the threat than the less than impressive father seems to need. I mean, it's kind of out of place. This father is surprised and doesn't seem to represent any serious danger. Second, he displays the by now characteristic cross-eyed gaze. The addressee of the threat thus doubles up between the father and the viewer because he looks with one eye to the father and with the other eye at us. And that's the eye, that you, the dark eye, the eye, the eye that's in the shadow, looks here, and the other eye looks there. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that, that is the, yeah, right. It is, <laughs> yeah, on one level that is what, that is what, he, what, what he's doing. And that's why it's cross-eyed. <laughs> but the net result is that the one eye hits us, and the other eye hits the father. And this doubling makes sense for an ambitious artist. The viewer is a father figure. 
the social father who must become a patron if the artist is to exist. And don't forget, and Svetlana Alba's book that is coming out in February is all about how Rembrandt created the social position of the artist. This was a very big issue for him to get patrons and to then keep his autonomy. There was a real neurotic problem, if you can say so. We only need to imagine how the fist, holding a, how the fist would hold a brush and we see the tension in the Boston panel re-emerge. Now, can we get back to the Boston panel quickly? Oh, no. Where he was precisely holding something strangely, not really a brush and not really ready. You could, you could supply the fist of the Samson there and he would go to work, right? Now, what the slightly arrogant expression in combination with the masterly paint did in the self-portrait, the fist is shaken towards the man in power. Uh, sorry, okay. Um, where, where is the, okay. The fist is shaken towards the man in power. That's where we were. Now, where is that on my text? Okay. Father, father-in-law holding the desired bride Viewer holding the desired commissions that enable the acquisition of the desired bride. There is this story about the higher class, richer woman, who had better acknowledge the idealized self, thus turning him into an ideal reality. That is, it depends on the viewer ultimately who is going to buy or not to buy the painting to establish the truth of this ideal. To say, well, this is idealized, you're not such a good painter. Or to say, yeah, indeed. And that is exactly what we have done to Rembrandt. We have, and, and this whole story about digging up his skull and giving him proper burial is the, the, the outcome, the last phase of this process that he initiated. Now, if this woman is, giving, is given the pose of an earlier self-portrait, according to Schwartz, and I suggest the urge of the double ambition of an other earlier self-portrait, the one that we... Uh, this one is... Uh, 33. No, self-portrait. That's uh, 31, yes. It is given the features, the eyes, the shape, the hair, and maybe the nose of a later self-portrait. The disguised one of the Samson. Oh, no. This miss is a mismatch of effect. Okay, look at her face. Yes, right, hair, eyes, nose, everything. And here we are again. Mm -hmm. Disguised. Given the complexity and most probably the unconscious force of this identification, it had to be disguised. The remarkably peaceful eyes resemble the fierce eyes of the young hero. Do I have to go back to... Oh, sorry. Okay. Eyes. Eyes. The, four, the shape of the eyes is identical. This woman figure not only assimilates in her image... No, no, what is this? Oh, I will never learn this. I, that's why I can't go into art history. <laughs> this woman figure not only assimilates in her image that of the young Rembrandt, idealized as a monument of Jewish beauty and as a tower of strength, but also holds the domesticated image of the defeated father in the shield. This Medusa is not petrifying, but petrified. Thus the structure Anabim wherein the visual representation on the shield is represented as visual representation. Don't forget that here is a, 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 a bas-relief uh, kind of visual representation within the painting, is brought back to a renewed literality. That is, the fact that the shield is, com that she is supposed to be alive and the shield is supposed to be petrified becomes here quite acute. The woman figure, capable of all this, combines the image of the frightening mother with that of a reassuring mother in this whole front, taking up all the space. <laughs> of the body and the head? Yeah. I don't understand it at the end of it. No, it's like a, like a monster. Yes. It, it, is, it is a monstrous uh, painting. Either it is a dwarf or what? It's a completely surrealistic disproportion. <laughs> and and nobody, nobody notices that. Can you believe it? They talk about how she doesn't look frightening. 
but they don't see how this body is completely out of proportion. The body is a bit smaller than actually is protecting the other body. But you look at the face. This is, this is half of the body. The, yeah. yeah, the body is too short and it's as if yes. all the, the volume had to be... Yeah. <laughs> it's in breadth rather than in length. Right? There is this, this sense that she must take up, up the whole space. It is a monster, I agree. It's absolutely a monster, and yet it's a reassuring image. Because she is not frightening. She is... No. Absolutely. No. Is that supposed to be full length, like her feet would be at the bottom there? No. Oh. No, it's not supposed to be full length. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but it's true that it's not supposed to be full length, but it is still, it has this monstrous effect. Mm -hmm. Go to the mat and you'll see it. It is monstrous also in terms of the background. Mm -hmm. In the Metropolitan, yes, in New York. So you can easily go and see it. <laughs> yes. I thought it was just that that was proportional. Yeah, because when you look at where her legs are, it's just the bottom. That's why. It's, everything is a misfit in this thing. That's why I picked it. Nothing fits. And and she actually doesn't cover her. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but it is as if she has, on the one hand, she has this monstrous body that literally leaves room for two because Rembrandt is part of it. And on the other hand, she has no body because this iron uh, harness, or how do you call it, just sits there. And you, you have a sense that there is no body. Is there, do you sense a gap between the breastplate and the skirt? That's right, it's yeah, there, yeah, I see what you mean. I must say that it didn't strike me as much in the real painting. So it may be that, that, that the slides slide can be terribly de deceptive. The slide can be just a little darker underneath so that it looks like uh, pushed back. The dress is on the right side of the shield. Yes. It is, yeah. There is no end to this body. And it even it even includes the father. If if the, if I'm right about the the suggestion that this is not only the the rhetorical Medusa but also someone who is frightened and who looks more like that father in the Samson than like anything else. So in a way, she is stronger, but in a strange way, stronger than the father, because she collaborates with rather than threatening the son who is as Samson strong enough to cope. That's why I put these two together. When you, if you are a Samson, you are so strong. You don't need anybody. But still he needs to, to creep into this body by putting the pose, the same as the self-portrait, some of the features of the face, like the eyes, which are precisely, the, the eyes are precisely what makes her less frightening, and this huge body where there is, I didn't say it as a joke, where there is room for two. But there, there, of course the balance, balance remains delicate between the position that the sun is acquiring and that's why that fist was a little over invested. And the price to pay for the magic that turns an idealized self-image into an ideal reality, which will always remain negotiable protecting in the move, the psychoanalytic perspective, from petrifying Rembrandt. It's because we have this sense that he never really achieves what he's trying to do, that keeps the paintings so vital, and that keeps them having an effect. Now, ideals originate in various sources. For a semiotic perspective of what they bring about, it is not enough to notice that ideals are at stake in the representation. The reason why the work works why the process of which the work sets forth the traces affects the viewer is according to the, this idea, this hypothesis of idealization, to be situated in a force with which ideals and reality clash. Now, there is no better example than, cl than a clash. So that idealization and the pursuit of limits become so urgent that they become part of the representation. The force of the clash between ideals and idealization in its turn is entailed by the variable force 
with which the ideals are held up for reasons that concern their compromise character. That is, this compromise that you always push the limits, but you will try to make the gap bridgeable or keep it bridgeable. One reason why a subject can, can experience an unusually intense need to idealize can be the urge to repair for extremely ambivalent features. I'm almost done, but this is really important because it brings us back to literature. The, and the destructiveness those ambivalent fe feelings entail. You know that when a child has aggression, it will turn against itself because it's so frightening, and then it will think that the parent whom he or she hates or wants to kill or whatever would kill him or her, etc. Now, then there is this urge to idealize the other person, the mother, for example, to repair that damage. And the craving for something extremely good, as Melanie Klein puts it in her, a little bit of object theory here, Melanie Klein says there is this craving for something extremely good to make up for that damage of the ambivalence that makes children and then later on adults uh, ambitious to create something uh, beautiful is a, a source of extreme ambition and may also be seen as the desire for reparation of damage feared. Since few of us escape ambivalent feelings towards powerful fathers and mothers who circumscribe our lives, the paintings discussed, including the idealized self-portrait, the pointless threat to the powerless father figure, the reassuring warrior mother hid us in our own cravings fears and resentments, and thereby trigger the positive response, or the strong response. It is not necessarily positive. You can be frightened or put off or hate it, or, but you're not indifferent. In contrast, a mere display of vanity, hatred of elderly men, or fear of impressive women would only irritate. I mean, you don't look upon this painting as, and that's why I, was, I am put off by the suggestion, oh, there was Rembrandt and his fear of women because that would irritate me. Personally, as, as a feminist, I'm irritated. I, can't, I don't want that crap anymore. And I would say no to the painting, and I don't say no to the painting. Hence, there is something else. And similarly, this hatred of elderly men in itself is not interesting. Elderly men are men too, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's the whole implication, the whole process, the subjective construction of that hatred that makes it effective in some way. Now, the Kleinian concept of reparation integrates the two aspects of standards mentioned above in a convincingly dynamic, although not harmonious, whole. And it's important that it somehow cannot be harmonious, and any attempt to make it harmonious is, in fact, a repression of, of the problem. The idealization of the representation of self or other and the pursuit of the standards of excellence in the ex execution of it, which draws idealization nearer to reality and reality nearer to the ideal. Now, uh, Joseph Westland, I have one more remark to bring this back to literary problems. Joseph Westland is a Shakespeare scholar who explains the effect of Shakespearean comedy by this aspect of idealization, thus interpreting the genre of romantic comedy as a whole. Whether or not such a genre will, in the case of specific works, be effective or not, in other words, whether they will be experienced as a successful effect of reparation, depends on the intensity with which the above clash has been turned into representation of ideals. Not just any idealized representation will be appealing to the need in the viewer to go about repairing the damage in her or her own interior life. Yet, sharing this appeal between artist and addressee is, the indisp is indispensable for the effect of such works. Hence, the works alone cannot work if the addressee do not bring to it the needs it helps to fulfill. In other words, if you, don't, if you happen to be one of those exceptional beings who have never had any ambivalent feelings towards parents and don't need to repair anything, maybe you will just don't like this painting and that's it. It won't hit you. Nor is comedy or its idyllic visual counterpart the only generic form in which reparation through idealization can take place. When involved in more painful endeavors, comedy and ideal, uh, how do you say that ideal? Uh, okay, ideal can become features, aspects, rather than genres, self-standing genres. And we can clearly see, and that's why I wanted to add this last remark, that both the Bellona and the Samson, although not comic and idyllic, are not without features partaking of those genres. 
the caricatural aspects of the Samson. Was this one forward? Forward? Yes. There is an aspect of caricature, uh, primarily aiming at the father, but not entirely sparing the son. And it's because it's not entirely sparing the son that it is not pure comedy. You know that in, in comedy, the father is defeated. And in tragedy, the son is defeated, according to one psychoanalytic theory. And in that way, the father here is more ridiculous than the son. But by this overinvested fist, the son is not spared. So there is a, a generic ambivalence here, then. He also has the same body problem as well. It's a terribly it's, small torso upper body and yeah it's not as outrageous though but it is a little bit oh, there is a little bit of that that's right sure. yeah now the, the identification with the lona seems to me quite obvious to tell you the truth yeah but hmm? i mean still now in the fist directed to the father becomes the shield with the father included and petrified and domesticated in the other painting so there is there are comic overtones into a work whose pretext is sharply tragic. I mean, the Samson story where the father ends up being killed with the daughter is quite spooky. While the woman's peaceful gaze, now do I go back now? No. The woman's peaceful gaze um, in the Bellona turns the warrior into a good shepherd, in other words, into an idyllic work. The force of the clash between pushing and transgressing the, the limits that the work can plausibly display become ramified into all aspects of the work as its decentered central meaning. It is only in this doubleness that this hypothesis of idealization and ideals and the tension between the two, subsuming both ideal setting and ideal pushing idealization, as well as the relations between them, can be inscribed, can inscribe the discourse of contradiction in what is otherwise just a visual image. The accent of the connections between these two paintings is neither purely visual, sorry, the account of the connection. I try to, to do something with the two, which is a connection that is not purely visual, if only because I needed so many words to uh, demonstrate it, nor is it simply discursive, because it was in fact discounting the discursive dimensions, like pretext and iconography, in favor of the more directly visual features. So that, that is one example where you cannot say it's either or. The discourse of psychoanalysis that makes room for the related concepts of ideals and idealization enabled us to see aspects in the works that account for the works as visual, as works of art, and as Rembrandt. In addition, these aspects together formed a discourse, filling in the one work with what it is not the other work. And that is in itself a discursive, in the semiotic sense, a discursive procedure. Both separately and together, these works are texts in that they disseminate and disseminate, in the sense that I developed in my talk the other, uh, last week, meaning on the condition that we are willing to use psychoanalysis to see these texts. To put it differently, and this seems an appropriate thing to end with, the Lona has no navel. But the shiny surface that covers it inscribes the navel's elusive centrality. In other words, this navel is there just by the emphasis on its absence. This, this, this plate, and somebody made a remark that it doesn't even cover her private parts. There is, there is a, an emphasis on something there that, on the other hand, seems to be absolutely out of place and without meaning. So this is that second or third psychoanalytic concept. I don't have time to develop the other one, which is about transitional objects. And you'll read it in the book when it comes out, years and years from now. Isn't there also like a slit in her skirt in the front? It's almost like yes. you could open it. Yes, it is. It is open. But there is something underneath which also has a slit. Yeah. There is a mise en abyme of slits that the, the, this, this breastplate covers only to display it. Yes. Right. So this, this uh, again, the, that's a displacement of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, looking at the tape. Yeah. <laughs>
There is again a distortion of the body, you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the, the body isn't, isn't put into a plate or whatever, the body is just such a plate as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a crazy painting again. I guess I picked the most crazy... Huh? It must be a custom made or... Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Now I try to in this in the, in the whole seminar I try to show you not a complete overview of Rembrandt's work, but um, somehow different genres, different um, you have seen drawings, etchings, paintings, history, portraits, etc. So there is, in a certain sense, there is a selective, of course, um, anthology of Rembrandt's work that you that we have. Uh, discussed.